I'm super excited to make this available to you guys. I started writing this in December of 2020, and it's available for pre-order as of today, July 7th, and the full release will be on August 18th. You can get it on Amazon or wherever books are sold, and you'll get it at a discount if you order before August 18th. Thanks and enjoy. Public Stoning, God's Design for a Nation Without Prisons. Written by Adam Terrell and narrated by Tim Stevenson. Published by Voluntary Theocracy, Moscow, Idaho. VoluntaryTheocracy.org Please visit the website for supporting documentation. In regard to copyright, only things where one can say, This is it, or Here it is, may be considered in regard to a breach of trust. Exodus 22.9 Therefore, this book may be freely copied and distributed without permission, for God is the owner of all knowledge and wisdom. This book is in the public domain. This work is dedicated to everyone behind bars. You have been mistreated, and I think of myself as chained with you. Hebrews 13.3 Chapter 1. Willful Ignorance of Capital Offenses Within Christ's Body I considered placing statistics here, and while statistics are important in creating a strategy, they are not useful in driving my point home, even if these personal anecdotes turn out to be incredibly uncommon. I won't debate the degree. That is no reason to have no justice system to deal with them. Houses don't catch fire often, yet there needs to be a system in place for how to put them out. You forget the ubiquity of fire hydrants on every street, but when they're needed, it has made the difference of life and death to countless people over decades. Having a godly system for dealing with capital offenders is the most basic requirement for any people. It's step one for building society. Without it, can you really have a cohesive city that stands firm in the greatest adversity? A single member of the city can dismantle it without some such system. I was looking for a roommate. I had a Christian brother refer me to another believer who was looking for a place to rent. I'll call him Herman. I asked Herman about his situation and found that he was seriously considering divorcing his wife. I told him that if he were to divorce his wife and get remarried, that would be adultery, Luke 16.18. I would consider that equal with murder, and I wouldn't allow him to continue being a roommate if he did that. He agreed, and he moved in as a sub lessee. Several months later, I met his wife for the first time. In our first conversation, she told me that Herman had slept with my neighbor's wife recently while he had been living in my house. I immediately went next door and asked her if that was true. She said it was true. I went back home and asked Herman if it was true. He wouldn't answer. I said if it wasn't true, he could continue renting from me. He immediately said he was moving out. Soon after, I called his pastor at the gathering where Herman played music regularly. I told him what the neighbor's wife had told me, as well as Herman's response when I confronted him about it. His response was, well, I can't live Herman's life for him. In other words, what was anyone supposed to do about it? At two other assemblies nearby, both pastors had stepped down due to adultery and fornication. One has since returned to ministry where he was before. At the other assembly, a third man who was leading Bible studies once bragged to me about how long he put up with his annoying former wife before he divorced her, and about how his new wife is so much better. He was gloating over his adultery after he just finished leading a Bible study. I have personally heard three fellow believers blaspheme God's name since I started listening for it a few years ago. The one who is a pastor has not been removed. That pastor also laughed to me that his daughter called him a Richard. He continued, She said that it's because it's another name for a bad word. It was really clever. I was so proud of her. He was not joking. Speaking lightly of one's parents is a capital offense. Exodus 21.17 I personally know two Christian women who have openly admitted to fornication multiple times. While not all fornication is a capital offense, 
It is for Israelites and daughters of priests. Deuteronomy 22, 20 and 21. Leviticus 21, 9. And all believers are priests and children of Abraham by faith. Revelation 1, 5 and 6. Romans 2, 26 through 29. These women still claim Christ's name. 1 Corinthians 5, 13. I have heard other accounts of similarly serious offenses taking place over the years, divorce and remarriage being most common, Luke 16, 18, along with false prophecy, Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22, children striking their parents and being gluttonous drunkards, Exodus 21, 15, Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21, and cursing God in prayers to him, Numbers 17, 10. Where is the mourning and repentance that we are called to as believers in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2? In 1 John 5, 16 through 18, we are told not to pray for a brother who commits a sin that leads to death. Adultery is one such sin. It's one of the few that's still understood as being serious enough to be removed from the body, at least sometimes. There are many more sins that are equally as bad, that have been forgotten. Regardless, the penalty for murder and adultery is the same in Scripture. Why are these unrepentant people still considered part of their local bodies? The Apostle Paul excommunicated men for blasphemy, 1 Timothy 1.20, something that many believers today would consider to be rather inconsequential, if they even recognized it happening at all. Many of these offenses are so neglected, there aren't even statistics on it. Where are the people stepping down from ministry due to having cursed their parents or struck them? Exodus 21.15, 1 Timothy 1.8, blasphemy, eating blood, Leviticus 17.10-14, Acts 15.29, or making a false prophecy in God's name. Where are these things seen as serious enough to be removed from the congregation by lawful means? Even if these are not widespread problems, the degree is nebulous, isn't it best to have a plan for what to do before a catastrophe happens? It's best to think about the consequences for these matters before one is caught in an offense. God's design for capital offenses is intended to provide just such a teaching opportunity. Yet even this warning of innocent bystanders is often neglected at best and spoken of as unloving at worst. We need to understand what God designed repentance to look like for a capital offense in the light of the law and what that means for believers today. It's highly uncomfortable by God's design, but refusing to understand the consequences of a capital offense will limit the grace these people seek from God. A sinner who has been forgiven little, loves little. Luke 7.47 Chapter 2. God's Authority and Heart in Public Execution A man named Antonin de Hayes stole World War II dog tags from the National Museum of American History. He was fined tens of thousands of dollars and condemned to 364 days in prison. Was he punished because the museum didn't value the dog tags? Was it not because they were of great value to the museum and to the American culture? What message would it send if they didn't respond or simply gave a $20 fine? The punishment is proportional to the offense. I'm not defending the court's use of prison or its attitude that war relics are holy and sacred, but as an illustration, the punishment is supposed to fit the offense and this court wanted to send a message that this was a serious offense, and so met it with a serious punishment. God says a life is worth a life. If we say that a life is worth less than a life, how can we say that we place a high value on life? The goal of public stoning is righteousness and to spread fear of repeating deadly evil. In other words, the purpose is life. This is the undercurrent of the entire law. Even in the laws for making war, men have a prior responsibility to build houses, take wives, work the ground, and enjoy the fruit of the trees. Deuteronomy 20, 5-7 and 19-20 The Great Commission 
is at stake. We must disciple the nations. But how? Jesus tells us. The first part is to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The second part is to teach them to observe all that He has commanded us. Matthew 28, 18-20. This includes stoning. Jesus tells us that every part of the law, down to the smallest stroke and dot that make up individual letters of the law, is eternal. Matthew 5, 17-20. Throughout the Gospels, Acts, Epistles, and the prophetic work of Revelation, the validity of the law is assumed, specifically referenced, and upheld as good. The letter of the law came through Moses, and the spirit of the law came through Christ. What does this mean? Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Christ said, Not only is the law that adulterers should be put to death good, but the spirit of the law goes even further, so that the act of even looking at a woman with lust is committing adultery in the heart. Hating a brother is also committing murder in the heart. Matthew 5, 21-30 Christ never relaxed the law. Matthew 5, 19 He tightened its requirements and gave new commandments. Matthew 19, 8-9 and John 13, 34 The letter of the law is lax compared to the spirit of the law, and the spirit of the law is what gives life. 2 Corinthians 3, 6 we see this attitude throughout the New Testament in examples of Paul using relatively obscure passages of the law to inform our conduct today. In 1 Corinthians 9.9, 9, Paul writes that he does not instruct by human authority, but from the authority of the laws given to Moses. In 1 Timothy 5.18 and 1 Corinthians 9.9, 9, Paul quotes Deuteronomy 25.4 to prove that he and Barnabas have the right to be paid for their work in teaching. The law there says not to muzzle the ox as it treads out the grain. Paul assumes that this law applies forever. Would it make sense to base a proof off of something that is no longer in effect? Paul is using the letter of the law, which is true and eternal, to show the spirit of the law, which is yet more true and eternal. He does this again in Colossians 3.5. Just as the law says to put to death the evil person from among you, we are to put to death what is earthly in our hearts, sexual immorality, covetousness, idolatry, and other evils. What sense would it make to say this if people aren't supposed to put to death the evil person from among them? Wouldn't this contradict the point Paul makes? Then in 1 Timothy 1, 5-11, Paul writes a list of capital offenses, saying that the law is good to use lawfully. And in verse 11, he says that the goodness of the law is in accordance with the glorious gospel. Later, in 1 Timothy 5.19, Paul upholds and refers to the laws for witness requirements found in Deuteronomy 19.15. His assumption is that the law still applies in every detail. In verse 20, he cites that the basis for public rebuke for unrepentant sin among believers comes from the law in Exodus and Deuteronomy. He says to rebuke in public so that the rest may stand in fear. This principle is based on the fear that public stoning is also meant to instill. Exodus 23.1, Deuteronomy 13.11, 17.13, 19.20, and 21.21. Again in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul addresses the assembly at Corinth, who are not mourning, but arrogant that a man has his father's wife. This is forbidden in the law, even if it were his mother-in-law, Leviticus 20.11, Deuteronomy 27.23. And then Paul tells the body to hand the man over to Satan to destroy his flesh, that his soul may be saved, and thereby purge the evil from among you. This is death penalty language. The phrase is only used in connection with capital punishment in Deuteronomy 13, 5, 17, 7, and 12, 19, 19, 21, 21, 22, 21 through 24, and 24, 7.
The Jews had made a Greek translation called the Septuagint from the original Hebrew, and Paul quotes this Greek translation word for word so that there's no mistake as to what he's referencing. If capital punishment according to the law is not something that God's people should even consider applying to themselves, why would Paul use a phrase only referring to the death penalty in the law as instruction for them when a man takes his father's wife? And the most personal example for Paul is found in Acts 25. The Jews had had enough of his teaching about the Messiah and his fulfillment of the law. Due to their long rebellion to God, they had most of their authority to execute stripped away from them by Rome for generations. They wished that Paul were dead, so they charge him by Jewish and Roman law of being guilty of death, anything they can do to get Festus the procurator to execute him by Roman authority. In verse 8, Paul says that there is nothing to their charges of violating Jewish law, and that if there were, he would not seek to escape death, in verses 10 through 11. If Paul were ever going to make the case that capital offenses did not deserve death at the hands of the people, wouldn't it have been then? Not only does he not make this case, but also he says, if there is merit to the accusations, he agreed that he should die. Contrast this with Acts 9:23 through 25 where Paul succeeded in escaping the Jews who plotted to kill him. So he simultaneously upholds the goodness and validity of the law while saying by his actions that there was no merit to their accusations. Now let's move to two examples of Jesus directly. The first is found in Luke 19:1 through 10 with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector and had sinned greatly by collecting much more in taxes than he was authorized to do. Luke 3.13 Zacchaeus knew the law of restitution for stealing, and so he knew the appropriate action to take to bear the fruits of repentance. He offered fourfold and fivefold restitution as found in Exodus 22.1, which King David also condemned himself with in 2 Samuel 12.1-7. These are no random amounts that Zacchaeus is offering. He offers four times the extra amounts he had collected from those he had defrauded. Where did Zacchaeus come up with this amount? There are three penalty levels for theft. One, a repentant thief who returns the stolen property on the day he realizes his guilt must restore the property and pay an additional fifth and offer a ram or equivalent as a sacrifice. Leviticus 6, 1 through 7. 2. A thief who is caught with the stolen property must restore double the property. Exodus 22, 4 and 7. 3. A thief who steals property and either sells or destroys what was stolen must pay a fivefold or fourfold penalty. Exodus 22, 1. Jesus doesn't condemn Zacchaeus for wanting to repent by obeying the laws for restitution. He doesn't tell Zacchaeus, A day is coming and is now here where you won't have to bow down in the letter of the law. He actually tells Zacchaeus that salvation has come to his house as evidenced by his faithful obedience to the law. This is a play on words because Jesus' name in Hebrew is Yeshua, which means the Lord saves. It was obviously literally true since Jesus is salvation for all who believe. He was physically come to Zacchaeus' house, but it was also true spiritually, as evidenced by the fruit of Zacchaeus' repentance. We have no other record of Jesus saying this to anyone. Since Zacchaeus was repentant in this matter, even though he was guilty of the third level of theft, profiting from it, a ram was to be sacrificed for him, as in the first level. Jesus, who was standing in front of him that moment, was that ram, or equivalent, to be sacrificed. And finally, Jesus' own opinion of stoning is shown in Mark 7, 5-13. The Pharisees bring up a point of dissension with Jesus because his disciples don't follow the traditions of the elders. Jesus condemns them for their traditions because not only do they refuse to execute children who revile their parents, the Pharisees encourage children in their reviling with the tradition that they set above God's law.
So Jesus condemns the Pharisees for encouraging children to commit a capital offense instead of stoning them to death for it. Yet, what nation won't be destroyed by such laws? The only reason societies continue to live is because God is merciful. This does not mean disobedience is acceptable. We know that obedience in the first place is better than disobedience first and then being granted mercy later. 1 Samuel 15.22 and Hosea 6.6 6. One day, death will die, and there will no longer be any need for mercy because there will no longer be any sin. Obedience will remain, and it is better than mercy, which is why God gives mercy, which has less value, in exchange for our obedience, which has more value. Obedience is doing the right thing the first time. Mercy is offering to obey on someone else's behalf after he has disobeyed. The former is of higher value. When King David committed adultery with Bathsheba against Uriah, and then killed Uriah with the sword, God condemned David's illegitimate son to death to preserve David's life. 2 Samuel 12, 13 and 14. David wished that he had obeyed from the start. The child's death was God's mercy to David, but David's obedience would have been better. So if we as believers fail to practice justice, we are a bad witness for Christ. The neglect of discussing and practicing these laws are hurting God's people and preventing us from growing by attracting outsiders by our fruit of the Spirit. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8, and Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The righteousness we are to exemplify is like a person's health. A healthy person seeks out what's best for him to eat and do to take care of his body. But if he does something foolish and breaks his leg, a good diet isn't going to set a broken limb or mend a torn ligament. If left unattended long enough, amputation may even be necessary. Likewise, if there's a growing tumor that's threatening to block someone's airways, a knife and some cutting must be done to ultimately save the rest of his body. Matthew 5:29 and 18:9. Christian community like any community, is based on a system of blessings and curses, which exist on a spectrum. In a family, certain privileges are obtained by trust and heightened accountability. This trust carries penalties for breaking faith in proportion to the weight of trust a task requires. Without greater consequences for disobedience, like priests in the temple, compare Exodus 22.16 and Leviticus 21.9, there can be no access granted for service. For example, a large business wouldn't trust an unknown pedestrian from the street to be the new executive decision-maker. If he is given actual control, he must be fully aware of the serious consequences of failure or breaking faith. Otherwise, there is too much risk of damage if he becomes untrustworthy. Dealing with capital offenses is the most basic tenet of any nation. If a nation has no will to remove murderers and other capital offenders from all contact with its people, it will eventually collapse or be destroyed. The goal is honoring God, which results in a healthy nation, long life, and prosperity. Deuteronomy 28, 1-14 In the same way, God's design for life and growth must include rewards for obedient living, and it must include punishment for disobedient living including death, so that further damage to others is avoided. See Deuteronomy 28's Blessings and Cursings. To neglect a whole view, positive and negative aspects, of righteousness is like saying all a person will ever need to be healthy is a good diet and exercise, no matter if it's obesity or a life-threatening tumor. All nations realize that certain actions cannot be allowed to any extent without undermining the foundation of human life. In our current day, many nations we find ourselves in agree with God on a few key issues when it relates to life and death matters. Some of these are murder, negligent killing, repeated drunkenness and rebellion against authority, kidnapping people, maybe the rape of a married woman, adultery and male homosexual acts in some parts of the world, and that's about it. 
While these are good, there are many more capital offenses that God warns us about, many of which are rampant among those who bear God's name. In Texas, where I was born and raised, not to conflate any earthly nation with God's nation, there have been about 700 murder convictions and 576 murder executions since 1982, as of 2022. To put that in perspective, there have been over 63,000 murders reported by participating jurisdictions in that same time period in Texas. So assuming that there are no additional murders in the jurisdictions that don't report, let's assume that every murderer killed three people. That's 21,000 murderers. Assuming every 20th murderer is convicted and executed, that's 1,050 executions required for murderers alone. That's almost double the amount we see, and these assumptions are absurdly low, and the average number killed by each murderer is absurdly high. This does not include anything else in the list of capital offenses that will be outlined in Chapter 4, many of which even many Christians couldn't care less about. I think it is a safe bet to say that there are many more children who curse their parents than there are murders committed, and with more witnesses, too. This is not a society that values life. We must do better, and God's people must lead the way.